Hello, welcome to UGC EPG Patshala Learning Sessions. I am Dr. Poonam Sharma, Associate Professor, Department of Geography, Shaheed Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi. Today, I am going to discuss a module of disaster management on the topic disaster management for landslides and avalanches. The mountainous stretches and hills of north and northeastern India as well as the Ghats region in the western and the southern India are highly prone to landslides. The threat of avalanches is eminent in the snow capped Himalayan regions. This module overviews the phenomena of landslide and avalanches and provides the basic knowledge on how to manage them. The learning objectives includes to understand the phenomenon of landslide and avalanches, to explore the causes and impact of landslides and avalanches, to describe the measures for their prevention and management. Let us first understand the concept of disaster management. In many mountainous environments, the most common hazard is the mass movement. This is the displacement of surface material downslope under the force of gravity occurring in almost any environment in which slopes are present. Both the landslides and avalanches are types of mass movements. Landslides consist mostly of rock and soil and snow avalanches are formed predominantly from snow or ice. These movements vary greatly in size ranging from a few cubic meters to over 100 cubic kilometers and in speed ranging from millimeter per year to hundreds of meters per second. They are responsible for large amount of damage with rapid mass movements generally causing, generally causing the greatest loss to life but slower movements cause most of the long term costs. Most mass movements are triggered by natural processes such as an earthquake. Intense or prolonged rainfall or rapid snow melt. However, some of the most damaging landslides occur in materials formed by human such as mining waste, garbage heaps, etc. People often play key role in the creation and triggering of mass movements. The term landslide describes downslope and outward movement of soil or rock under the influence of gravity. While many landslides do occur through the process of rock or soil sliding on a distinct surface, this is not necessarily the case. While many landslides do occur through the process of rock or soil sliding on a distinct surface. This is not necessarily the case, thus the term can be something of a different nature. In fact, there is a wide variety of types of movement that includes falling, sliding and flowing. The type of movement depends upon the angle of the slope, the nature of the material and the various st stresses that act upon them. Figure 1 shows a landslide progression, the loosened mass located in the area of initial failure moves down the slope and, depo and deposits in the fan at the foothill region. Landslides mostly occur in the five major types of terrains. This includes upland areas subject to seismic activities, mountainous environment with high relative relief, areas of moderate relief suffering severe land degradation, areas with high rainfall, areas covered with thick deposits of fine grained material. Now I am going to discuss the causes of landslides. There are many ways in which slopes may fall depending on the angle of slope, the water content and the type of earth material involved. Local environmental factors such as ground temperature etc 
Yet, landslides are commonly regarded as most predictable geological hazards. Few parameters of particularly important for monitoring all kinds of mass movements. Figure 2 explains few examples of the landslides. Ground cracks are the surface manifestations of a variety of mass movements in plane. They are commonly concentric and parallel and have width of a few centimeters and length of a several meters, which distinguish them from much shorter cracks. The formation of cracks and the increase in their rate of widening is common measure of impeding slope failure. The appearance and the increase in the ground subsidence and upheaval is also a good indicator of impending failure. Special conditions and processes exist in the permafrost terrains. Landslides and mud flows of permafrost region are mobilized and shaped by the freezing and thawing of the water pores by the active layers, the base of which act as a shear discontinuity. Failure here can occur on the slopes as low as 1 degree. Jellification, the form of solification, the slow down slope movement the of waterlogged soil and, and surface debris is a regular downslope flow and creep of the seasonal frozen and thawed soil. Gentle to medium slopes with blankets of loose rocks segments, overlying frozen grounds may be subjected to mass movements such as, such as rock glaciers, rock streams. In this case, catastrophic slope failure can expose new frozen ground, setting off renewed mass wasting. Climate change may accelerate or slow down the natural rate of soil failure, the natural rate of slope failure through changes in the precipitation or in the vegetation cover that binds the loose slope materials. Wildfires can also promote mass movements by destroying tree covers. However, it is difficult to generalize where information is lacking on the present distribution and signifies and significance of landslide because many parameters in addition to climate change contributes to slope stability. The areas of slope failure is a measure of the extent of landsliding in any region. Changes over time may both reflect significant environmental stresses and provide important clues about landslide and ecosystem degradation. The mass movements, landslides, mass wasting may take place suddenly and catastrophically resulting in debris and snow avalanches rock falls, slides and flows. For example, the initial velocity of mud flow can reach 30 meters per second in a few seconds, slowing to several days. Slower movements result in slides with complex landslides and creeps. Major landslides in the recent years, 1998 in Bangladesh and China, Multiple high impact landslides due to heavy summer rains, around 1200 people were killed in Bangladesh and around 3600 in China. October 30th, 1998, Nicaragua in a major landslip in the Casitas northwest of the Nicaragua capital, 2200 people died in the wake of cyclone. March 1998, Pakistan, 1500 people were killed due to the due to the landslides induced in the flooding of southwestern Pakistan. February 2006, Philippines, in the massive landslide in the Filipino village of Ginsogun, more than 1000 died of which 133 bodies were recovered and 973 were left missing. November 2001, Algeria, in the major landslide is Bab 
Al Oud quarter of Algeria, more than 700 people died and around 100 went missing. 20 July 2000, again in China, mudslide and landslides due to heavy seasonal rains killed 600 people. June 5, 1996, China, in two landslides in a gold mine in Chinese province of Yunnan, more than 200 people were found dead or missing. December 2004, Philippines, following a series of tropical storms, over 200 people were killed after floods induced and mudslides in the western, in the eastern Philippines. Now let's look into the avalanches. In as with the slow failure in the rock and soil, a snow avalanche occurs when shear stress exceeds the shear strength of the material. A mass of snow lo located on the top. The strength of this snowpack is related to its density and temperature. Compared to other solids, snow layer have the ability to undergo large changes in the density. Thus, a layer deposited with the original density of 100 kilogram, 100 kg cubic meter may densify to 400 kg cubic meter during the course of a winter, largely due to the weight of overlying snow pressure, melting and the recrystallization of the ice. This densification increases the strength of the snow. On the other hand, the shear strength decreases as the temperature warms towards 0 degrees Celsius. As the temperature rises further such that liquid melt, such that liquid melt water is present in the pack and the risk of movement of the snow blanket increases. There are two basic types of avalanches, loose snow avalanches and slab avalanche. These are further subdivided according to whether snow involved is dry, damp or wet. Whether the snow slide originates in a surface layer or involved in the whole snow cover and whether the motion is on the ground in the air or mixed. Three distinct sections of an avalanche track can usually be identified. These are the starting zone where the snow initially breaks away from the track or path followed the run out zone where the snow decedes and stops. Because avalanche tend to reoccur at the same site, the threat, from the, the threat for the future event can often be detected from the recognition of the previous avalanche path in the landscape. Clues in the terrain including breaks of the slope, eroded channel of the hillside and damaged vegetation. In heavily forested mountains, avalanche path can be identified by the age and species of the trees, by the sharp trim lines separating the mature undisturbed forest from the cleared slopes. Once the hazard is recognized, a wide range of potential adjustment is available, some of which are shared with the landslide hazard mitigation. Figure 3 explains avalanches in the Himalayas near Mount Everest. Now let us look into the causes. The gradual loading of snow takes place on slopes which gives the snowpack an opportunity to adjust by deformation because of its plastic nature. Without any damaging failure, the most important trigger of pack failure tend to be heavy snowfall, rain, thaw or some artificial increase in the dynamic loading such as skiers traversing the surface sur such as skiers traversing the surface. However, the commonly held perception that avalanche can be triggered by sound waves such as the noise generated by overflying aircraft is a myth. For failure to occur is a hazardous snow pack, the slope must also be sufficiently steep to allow the snow to slide. 
avalanche frequently is thus related to slope angle most events occurring on the intermediate slope gradient between 30 to 45 degrees angles below 20 degrees are generally too low for sliding to occur and most slopes above 60 degrees rarely accumulate sufficient snow to pose a threat most avalanches start at fracture points in the snow blankets where there is high tensile stresses such as a break of ground slope overhanging snow cornice or where the snow fails to bond to another surface such as a rock outcrop avalanches are released by an increase in stresses and a decrease in strength though internal metamorphism or stress developing may sometimes initiate a snow rupture avalanches are often dislodged by external triggers ice for ice fall falling cornices earthquakes rock falls thermal changes blizzards and even other avalanches are common natural triggers avalanches can also be triggered by loud sounds such as shouts machine noise and sonic booms in the absence of external triggers an unstable snow may revert to stability with the passage of time as long as no avalanche occurs the snow cover is similar to that of ice as both are viscoelastic material that exhibits creep behavior over time snow deforms continually without fracturing as the load on the top of it increases however the loading rate is critical heavy snowfall over a short duration leads to greater probability of avalanche occurrence a snowfall of 1 meter in one day is far more hazardous than 1 meter over 3 days landslides and avalanches in the indian context india has the highest mountain chain on the earth the himalayas which are formed due to collision of indian and eurasian plates the northward movement of indian plate towards china causes continuous stresses on the rocks rendering them friable weak and prone to landslide and earthquakes the indian crust is moving slowly about 5 cm per year which accumulates stresses and many natural disasters and attributes to this some landslides make unique and unparalleled catastrophes besides the himalayas the northeastern hill ranges north western ghats the nilgiris the eastern ghats and the vindhyas in that order covering about 15% of the landmass of india is affected by landslides the himalayas alone count for the most number of landslides per year which vary in size speed and extent and every possible characteristics landslides in the northeastern region of west bengal the hill states of sikkim mizoram tripura meghalaya assam nagaland arunachal pradesh poses chronic problems causing recurring economic losses worth worth millions of rupees a different variety of landslides characterized by lateritic cap poses constant threat to the western ghats in the south along the steep slopes overlooking the konkan coast besides nilgiris which is highly landslide prone in figure 4 landslide zones in india are shown the major tragedies occurred in varnavat landslide uttarkashi district malpa landslide pithoragarh district okla okimat landslide chamoli district uttarakhand and palgar jhora darjeeling district as well as sikkim isol sports complex mizoram these are some of the more recent examples of landslides now i'll explain the prevention and mitigation to provide protection against landslides 
The design and construction of measures to prevent slope failure is a routine task within the geotechnical engineering. For example, within the 1100 square kilometer area of Hong Kong, over 57,000 slopes have been engineered to prevent failure. Similarly, the railway agencies in UK, Net Work Rail has to maintain over 16,000 kilometer of earthwork designed to prevent slope failures. Methods of slope protection are well developed and includes the following. Drainage, as slope failure are generally linked to the presence of high water pressure in a slope, drainage is a key technique to, drainage is a key technique for improving the stability. The aim is to either prevent water from entering a critical area of slope by installing gravel lifted trench drains around the area or to remove water from within a slope by installing horizontal drains. In most cases, drainage is effective but problem often arises due to lack of maintenance. Drains can easily become blocked with fine particles or with animals using them as burrows. In addition, small amount of movement in a slope can cause drains to become cracked or broken and also to leak water into the slope at critical locations. The landslide threat can be minimized by reducing the overall slope angle. This can be achieved by excavating the upper parts of the slope or by placing the material at the toe. An approach often used during road construction in upland areas. In some areas, good results can be achieved by removing, by removing the natural slope, soil or rock and replacing it with the lighter material. While effective, such approaches are often technically challenging and expensive. Supporting structures, piles, buttresses and retaining walls are widely used for slope lying adjacent to buildings and transportation routes. Although effective, this is an expensive and visually intrusive way of to stabilize the slopes. Increasingly, there is a move towards the use of measures that sits with, within the soil and rocks rather than on the surface. Examples include soil nails and rock bolts, both of which seek to increase the stability by increasing the resistance of the movement. In addition, the structures can also be designed to deflect landslides around vulnerable facilities. For example, diversion walls are often constructed around electricity pylons in mountain areas in order to deflect small debris flows. Vegetation of slopes perform several functions. Plants, plant roots help to bind soil particles together and provide resistance to the movement. The vegetation canopy protects the soil surface from rain splashes, impact while transpiration process reduces the water content of the slope. In recent years, a new breed of bioengineering has emerged. It is critically important to ensure that the used plant species can maximize the beneficial effect and thrive in the environment in which they are planted. Thus, the preference is to use local species of trees and plants. Bioengineering is also considered to be more environmental conscious than traditional engineering approaches and provide the better visual aesthetics. Let us look into the protection against avalanches. There are two protective measures against the avalanches which include artificial release and defense structures. Artificial release says in most cases artificial release is accomplished through the use of small explosive charges to trigger controlled avalanche. This technique is used surprisingly often in USA about, about 10,000 avalanches are triggered through artificial release each year. The main advantage of the artificial release are 
snow release occur at predetermined times when the downslope areas affected are closed. Measures to allow snow clearance can be put in place where the avalanche occurs minimizing the inconvenience. Snowpacks can be released safely in several small avalanches rather than allowing the built up of the major threats. Defense structures. The use of defense structure has become the most common adjustment to avalanches throughout the world. In Switzerland alone, the total amount spent on avalanche defense structure in the period 1950 and 2000 was approximately 1 billion. Retention structures are designed to trap and retain snow on a slope and thus to prevent the initiation of an avalanche or to stop a small avalanche before it can develop fully. Redistribution structures are designed to prevent snow accumulation by drifting. In particular, they are used to prevent the built up of cornices that often breaks off steep slopes and initiate the avalanche. Deflectors and retarding devices are placed in the avalanche track and the runout zones. They are usually built of earth, rock or concrete are designed to divert the flow of snow from the path. Direct protection structures such as the avalanche sheds and galleries provides the most complete avalanche defense. They are designed to allow the flow to pass over key built facilities and avalanche sheds typically act as protective roofs over roads or railways. Now let us understand the role of NDMA. NDMA guidelines for landslide and avalanches in India. The main objectives of NDMA guidelines are to institu institutionalize are to institutionalize the landslide hazard mitigation efforts to make society aware of the various aspects of landslide hazard in the country and to prepare society to take the suitable actions to reduce both risk and cost associated with the hazard. The recommendations include continuously updating the inventory of landslide incidences affecting the country, landslide hazard zonation mapping in macro and meso scales after consultation with the border road organization, state governments and local communities. Pilot projects to be taken up in different regions of the country to carry out detailed studies and monitoring of the selected landslides to assess their stability status and estimate risk setting and estimate the risk. Setting pace shutter example for stabilization of slides and also setting up early warning systems depending on the risk, evaluation and cost benefit ratio. Completion of the site specific studies for major landslides and plan treatment measures and encourage state governments to continue these measures. Institutional mechanism have to be set up for generating awareness and preparedness about landslide hazards among various stakeholders, training and capacity building measures to be taken for the professionals and organization working organizations working in the field of landslide management. New codes and guidelines to be developed on landslide studies and existing ones have to be revised. An autonomous national center for landslide research studies and management has to be established. Implementation of the above action points would increase efficacy in the management of landslides and avalanches in the country. The above measures should be duly backed by requisite operational, legal, institutional and financial support. The measures of rehabilitation includes landslide and avalanche can cause huge loss of life and property. Livelihood of many people are disrupted and many are displaced or become homeless. Thus, proper rehabilitation measures are needed to be implemented. 
measures of the rehabilitation of a community affected by landslides or snow avalanches will depend on very much the extent of damage done by the disastrous event. If the damage is not severe, rehabilitation in the form of short term relief is provided to restart normal activities. Long term measures are taken so that any future landslides or snow avalanches do not harm the community or at least not a great extent. Reduction in the risk of the site through technical measures like strengthening or modifying the slopes, removing the fragile and unstable portions, securing, sn securing snow accumulations by snow fences, snow nets or may by be by or may be by cribbing or improvement of the drainage. Prohibitions of indiscriminate quarrying and mining in the mountain areas. Afforestation in zones prone to landslides, snow avalanches so that trees and vegetations provide a binding force to the binding force to prevent slippage of debris, rock and snow. Creation of a voluntary community based preparedness creation of a voluntary community based preparedness system of watch, monitoring and alert. This will not only be useful in times of a disaster, but will also provide self confidence, which is an essential objective of an of an effective rehabilitation program. Also of assistance for economic rehabilitation by arranging work, employment, loans and grants. In extreme cases where severe damage occurs to a community by landslide or snow avalanche, the site can be marked as totally unsafe or unusable. In that case, rehabilitation in the form of relocation and reconstruction occurs. In such an event, the new site is chosen to minimize vulnerability and risks. While concluding the session, I would like to say landslides and avalanches are two most significant hazards in India. The speed of onset and size of the affected area can vary significantly. Landslides can be predicted utilizing signs like formation of ground cracks, appearance of and increases in the ground subsistence or upheaval etc. Climate change and environmental degradation might enhance the process of landslide. A snow avalanche occurs when the shear stresses exceed the shear strength of the mass of snow located on a slope. Avalanches occur mostly in the slope areas between 30 to 45 degrees. Measures to protect against the landslides include improving drainage, regrading supporting structures, development and improving the vegetation cover. Avalanche protection measures includes artificial release and development of defense structures like retention structures, redistribution structures, deflectors, retarding devices and direct protection structures etc. NDMA has developed guidelines for both prevention and mitigation of landslides and avalanches, rehabilitation and relocation of people affected by the landslides depend on the size and impact of the event. That is all for today's discussion. I hope the discussion was fruitful and value added your understanding about the hazards of landslide and avalanches. Thanks for visiting the site and viewing. Goodbye, see you in the next talk.